Segovia Show. Welcome to the Andres Segovia Show, everyone. I am your host, Andres, the Honest Broker. Thank you for joining me on this rainy day that I record this episode. In this episode, I kick off my first two-part series in which I'll be covering the subject of rent control. This episode, though, it's uh, relations to Real Estate 101, in which I'll be answering the question, what is the Rent Stabilization Ordinance, or what's better known as simply rent control? If you tuned in to my previous episode of the News Roundup, you would have noticed that I had a lot more uh, headlines dealing with rent control. And for my question and answer series, you would have noticed that I was addressing those said questions, especially for the local markets, uh, especially the ones I service, because there's been a lot of rumblings, even in the local areas, about rent control. So that's how prevalent this uh, issue is. And it's been debated hotly in different city councils. And in some cases, some cities have gone to the extent of barring the opposition. And in that sense, what I mean is that the city councils locked out those who oppose rent control because that's how much they want to push rent control into their respective cities. So uh, in this episode, though, of of the Andres Segovia show, uh, we're going to be answering the question, what is the rent stabilization ordinance in a segment of Real Estate 101? And in the next episode, I'll be addressing the myth that rent control is actually beneficial and does good. But that would be for the next episode. So you're going to want to stay tuned for that one. But first, I want to I want to introduce this topic itself. Like, what is it? How did it come to be? And what is it exactly uh, doing or meant to do? But to do that, it I can't go over every single rent stabilization ordinance. So I'll be defining it more based along the lines of my local market. Mostly Los Angeles, because that's the biggest uh, city that I service that has rent control. And it's it's a model that a lot of neighboring cities try to follow as well. And it's one of the oldest rent controls that I, that I, as I understand it, um, in the state of California. But there are rent control cities. There's at least 15 cities in California that practice their own rent stabilization ordinance. Uh, even the state of Oregon has gone to the extreme in in uh, just over a month ago, where they're introducing statewide rent control. And of course, this is even debated at the the federal level. So this thing is just absolutely everywhere but let's talk about the basics of what the rent stabilization ordinance or better known as rent control is meant to do so before i get into the los angeles rent control uh, ordinance um, let's just talk about what the spirit of rent control is because it's a general understanding of it and the basic the baseline reason for it is standard all across wherever it's practiced doesn't matter the state or the city so the intent of rent control is to set a cap on rent increases most rent control laws place a limit on how much you can increase a tenant's rent by when their lease is up for renewal this amount is usually based on an area specific measurement such as the local cost of living or inflation in new york city apartments that are limited by rent increases are known as rent stabilized apartments not rent controlled apartments a rent control could set a cap on rent in new york city rent controls put a limit on how much you can charge for rent for example you cannot charge more than 700 dollars for rent for a rent controlled one bedroom Uh, Rent control also regulates the frequency of rent increases. So the law can can dictate how often the landlord can increase the rent. And rent control limits reasons for evictions. There may only be a handful of reasons a landlord can evict a rent controlled tenant, such as non-payment or significant damage to the rental property. The theory behind rent control is to allow certain tenants to reside in an area that they may have otherwise been priced out of. So, for example, an elderly woman who has been living in an apartment for the last 50 years would be forced to move if there were no rent control laws because the area she's living in has become very desirable and expensive. Due to rent control, the tenant can expect a small, steady rent increase and will not one day be hit with a notice that the rent is increasing by a thousand bucks. 
Now, the impact on landlords. So rent control negatively impacts landlords because the landlords are renting out units to tenants at far below the current fair market value of the unit. Besides the fact that they are collecting far less money for the unit, a rent control tenant can even cost landlord money. The landlord is still responsible for paying all the holding costs associated with the unit, which are all at today's current market prices. The landlord is responsible for performing the repairs on the tenant's units, in some cases paying for utilities as well for all other expenses for the property, such as mortgages, taxes, and insurance payments. So now we're going to move to talk about the Los Angeles uh, Stabilization Ordinance. The Los Angeles City Council passed rent control in 1978 and has maintained it ever since. Rent control is part of the Los Angeles Municipal Code, the ordinances which specifically regulate things within the city. The Rent Stabilization Board of Los Angeles, or RSB, is part of the City Housing Department, which also sends out code enforcement building inspectors to cite the landlords for substandard buildings and require the landlord to make repairs. The Rent Stabilization Board makes its own regulations to clarify the rent control law and help in applying it. So how does rent control work? The rules are different in every city, Uh, and again, this is in relation to Los Angeles. In the city of Los Angeles, it means that the renters in apartments covered by the ordinance should only see their rents rise between 3 to 8% annually. And it's determined by the consumer price index. So for the, the year of 2019, which is fiscal year, which begins in July 1st, then right now it's 3%. But starting July 1st, uh, landlords can raise 4% on their tenants that live in that rent, uh, rent stabilization um, ordinance area. So some years it might not mean much. So over the last 12 months of this article from the LA Curb, from uh, this is actually now uh, just over 12 months, rents rose just over 2% citywide. So that's in both rent-controlled and non-rent-controlled apartments. Over time, though, as the rental market heats up and cools back down, tenants and rent control units usually pay much less than they might have otherwise. Are you as a tenant protected from evictions? If you are under rent control, even if you do not have the rent increase limits, the Los Angeles rent control law limits evictions to 12 legitimate reasons in order to prevent eviction abuses. Unlike cities without rent control where tenants can be evicted for nearly any reason and no reason at all, in Los Angeles, the landlord must prove the reason for the eviction and follow special procedures for some evictions. Reasons fall into two categories. Number one, where the tenant did something wrong. And number two, where the tenant is not at fault. There is such thing as a rent reduction hearing as well. The RSB has the authority to reduce your rent if your unit is uninhabitable or there is an overcharge. You file a complaint and the landlord has to come to a hearing where the reduction is determined. When it comes to major rehabilitation relocation, this is effective as of May 2nd, 2005, where the landlord has to perform major rehab on the units or portions of the entire building, the tenants can be temporarily relocated, not evicted, and 50% of the cost of the work can be applied to rent increases of up to 10% as permitted by the housing department. The landlord, though, must pay for all of the temporary relocation costs of the tenant, including hotel expenses, food, daycare, moving costs, and phone transfers. If the work will take longer than 30 days, the temporary housing must be comparable in size, rooms, accessibility, and proximity to services and institutions like schools and hospitals, such as another unit in the complex or different apartment building entirely. If less than 30 days, it can be a hotel or motel within two miles suitable for the tenant's needs with standard amenities. The landlord has to give at least seven days notice to return to the apartment afterwards. The tenant must cooperate or be evicted on that ground. However, the landlord cannot evict without following every procedure, including paying for all the accommodations, presenting the plan, and giving the required notice. The tenant must also continue to pay for the rent. If the repairs are minor, the landlord can perform the work during 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday without relocating the tenant at all, so long as the tenant is not exposed to toxic substances such as asbestos, lead paint, and mold. And this goes on and on and on, but I think you're getting the idea of what rent control is dictating that can be done with units that are being rented out. Now, what is covered under 
the rent stabilization ordinance. And this is where I'm pulling from the Los Angeles Housing Community and Investment Department to show you what's covered under all this. So generally the RSO, rent stabilization ordinance, applies to rental properties that were first built on or before October 1st, 1978, as well as replacement units under the RSO section 151.28. And it is any of the following. Apartment, condominium, townhouse, duplex, two or more single family dwelling units on the same parcel, rooms in a hotel, motel, rooming house or boarding house occupied by the same tenant for 30 or more consecutive days, residential units attached to a commercial building. Your rental unit is not subject to the RSO if you live in a single family home, you live in an affordable housing or luxury housing unit exempted by the HCIDLA, that's the Housing Community and Investment Department of Los Angeles, the rental unit was built after October 1st, 1978 in most instances. And if you live in a hotel or motel room that were occupied for less than 30 days, and if you rent a unit in a converted commercial building that converted to rental units after October 1st, 1978. What the RSO covers are allowable rent increases, registration of rental units, legal reasons for evictions, types of evictions requiring payment of tenant relocations assistance, and RSO disclosure notice for all cash for keys or buyout agreements. Let me highlight that section that the RSO covers registration of rental units. So as a property manager as well, can tell you that the properties managed, all of them in the rent control area of Los Angeles need to be registered and annually paid a fee to the HCIDLA for simply having rental units. And by that, you're also funding whatever they're doing to come to your unit to inspect it and dictate to you whether or not it needs repairs and what to be done. Rent increases that do not require the, the approval are, for example, a new rent levels established after a tenant voluntarily moves out, does not pay rent and is evicted, violated the lease agreement and is evicted, is evicted for failure to comply with a tenant habitability plan, or is evicted per a city attorney order. Rent may be increased once every 12 months by an allowable rent increase percentage. Their effective calendar of the, the fiscal years of July 1st through June 30th. If an additional tenant moves into a rental unit, landlords can increase the rent within 60 days of learning about the additional tenant. Um, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of little items that uh, get a lot more specific. But the rent increases that require the approval of the Housing Community and Investment Department of Los Angeles is a Capital Improvement Program or Primary Renovation Program, Rehabilitation Program, Seismic Retrofit Program, and Just and Reasonable Rent Increase. So a, a landlord can apply for a rent increase when their net operating income adjusted for inflation is not sufficient to cover the property's operating costs. Now, I will go into more detail about how this actually plays out in the next episode where I debunk the myth that rent control is actually a good thing. So you, I can already tell you that as wonderful as all this sounds, especially to tenants who are paying rent and feel that their rent is really high, and, it's, and in some cases akin to a mortgage, they would think that, well, yeah, this thing definitely looks after my own interest. Well, that's why I'm teasing for this next episode, because last year, the 2018 election cycle showed just how extreme this is getting and the damage that it's caused to cities that are practicing rent control, including the city of Los Angeles. So I will go into that and oh, in the next episode. But until then, if you have any questions that I haven't yet answered in regards to rent control or what it all ultimately means, now you can hold on some of that because I might be answering it in the next uh, in the next episode. And if I don't, then by all means, go to my Facebook page um, of the Andres Segovia and you can put in your questions there. And you can hit me up on any of the socials such as Instagram or Twitter. Uh, but most of all, uh, you can stay up to date with everything that I'm doing through theandrasegovia.com.
com and listen to my show there as well so you're going to want to like share subscribe to wherever you might be listening if you're on youtube listening to this then you have to hit the notification bell to know when the next episode is up and you can also leave your questions um on the youtube comment section because i do check all that out so there's many various ways you can reach out to me but most of all uh, what i'm trying to do here is to um, share in all fairness what the intent was of rent control and ultimately how it's played out because it's, it's been enacted for multiple decades here in uh, in Los Angeles, there there's a lot of uh, um, smoke and mirrors being thrown up, so it can distract you as from an individual from learning the truth about rent control. So that does it for this episode of the program. I'll see you on the next one.